Welcome to the Immersive Tech and Business Podcast, where we explore immersive technologies, understand how they are redefining the way we work, and how you can stay informed and ahead of the competition. We'll explore how immersive technologies are redefining business, speak to industry experts who are building the future, and real people like you using these technologies every day. Welcome everybody to our next episode of Immersive Tech in Business. And today we have a very, very interesting conversation. Um, we're carrying on around the theme of immersive technology, virtual reality in, in educational context. But the person that we have joining us today is has such a like a wider, broader, more vast um, exposure to the immersive technology industry. Super excited to have her, and um, with all of her accolades, it's it's like we're we're hosting a rock star on the show today. So um, as usual, uh, as usual, I'm joined by Karen, my co-host, um, and uh, joining us today is Alex Pryor and. A little bit of background about Alex. She uh, works as part of the Digital Innovation Lab at EOH. Um, part of her, her role there is she's also part of something called the Rocket Lab, which is a, a venture lab, a venture studio for startups and, and founders who want to get more into this immersive technology metaverse space. Um, But not to stop there, she is also the founding member of the Africa Web3 revolution. And we'll talk a little bit about that later on, because I think there's some really, really interesting stuff we're going to be talking about from an African context. And Alex brings a lot of that exposure um, along for the conversation. And finally, she's also a founding member of the World Metaverse Council. So welcome, Alex. Um, It's great to have you. Thank you. Um, Lovely to be here, Jason. Thank you. Let's start. Um, just tell us about this. This, uh, this, like a little bit about Rocket Lab, the World Metaverse Council. Mm. I'm sure everybody's curious to know what what these things are. Mm. Okay, perfect. So, so as you said, I I head up digital innovation for EOH, uh, which is one of Africa's largest ICT service providers. And the area I sit in is, uh, as you say, called uh, Rocket Lab Ventures or Rocket Lab Studios. Uh, still busy, sort of finalizing which of the two we're going for from a naming perspective. But as you say, it's really around growing and scaling businesses um, to be the best business they can be in 2030. And as we know in this space, uh, technology is changing so rapidly and what not just augmented reality, but all the technologies that are currently coming into play, businesses who ignore them really do so at their own risk because Mm -hmm. what business looks like in two years, five years, 10 years time, is going to be very different from today. And we can't predict exactly what that will look like. So we're really aiming to to help businesses um, to start off with just educate themselves on the possibilities, but also take those businesses and scale them. So uh, I'm a massive enthusiast of the Web3 space. I'm incredibly passionate about it. As I said to you yesterday, you're going to have a hard time getting me to shut up on this one. So um, (laughs) please do jump in if I'm going on and on and on. The World Metaverse Council is a new global cooperative. It was launched in September of last year, and that really aims to connect global communities in the metaverse, but also to really put together a set of global standards around what metaverses should be, how people should interact, how do we protect children, how do we, uh, how do we, I'm going to say use the word certify, but how do we issue and how do we prove that metaverses are actually meeting those global standards and what should those global standards be? And that's through uh, partnerships and conversations with public sector, with private sector, with business. Uh, And certainly we, we want as many people to get involved as possible with that. And then finally, the, uh, the Africa web through revolution is uh, something I started. And that's really because when I was at conferences last year, what I realized was first, it was two things. Firstly, how fragmented and how siloed businesses in emerging tech in Africa are. But also, honestly, I, I was embarrassed. I was at a, one of the, I think it was Crypto Fest, and I didn't recognize half of the businesses on the floor, the African businesses. I knew all the international ones. I've been Im- deeply immersed in the space for more than two years, 
and I didn't know the African businesses. And that was true with most people I spoke with. So the idea behind it, it's just, it's a community organization that aims to grow, to build, to promote and connect people within this industry on the African continent and to expand our profile globally as, uh, as Africans, because we are the second largest population in terms of numbers behind Asia. We are the second largest area in terms of landmass behind area. And fun fact, Web3 fact, uh, Africa is also the second largest Bitcoin market, um, if you look at it per, per, uh, per population uh, percentage. So and we're one of the ones with the biggest need for new financial markets and methods um, in order to, to empower and enable people. So Africa really is stands to be the next powerhouse for this type of technology and new use cases and using it. And we never hear about it. So that's really why I started the revolution was to say, let's talk about it. Let's talk to each other. Let's help each other. And really, let's uh, let's build the profile of Africa. Brilliant. That's absolutely fascinating. And um, we'll definitely talk more about the web, the Africa Web3 thing shortly. But what I wanted to to jump in first is I know that that you have been very busy developing a, a VR soft skills um, experience called In Your Shoes, which is is kind of in the process of, of going live um, being offered to mm. customers. So um, do you want to tell us a little bit about that and, and why, why you created the solution, what it is? Mm. Um, that would be awesome. Yes, Great name, absolutely. by the way. So it's actually called In My... <laughs> it's actually called in my shoes but uh but uh, oh, okay. <laughs> close enough um yeah so so it is in fact called in my shoes and it was the brainchild of our uh of our hr director Malisha awana she's our head of uh, people and culture she's absolutely amazing but she has been uh in uh employ in the employee and hr relationship business for many many years and one of the biggest issues that she saw with an hr context was unconscious bias in the workplace. Um, as individuals, we are defined by certain parameters in our brain. And we think that everyone else has the same lived experience that we do. Um, and we can read about it and we can watch videos about it, but we don't really get it. So um, it was uh, about, I think we've, it's been about 18 months that the project has been going. It launched, uh, launched in about September, October last year. But the idea was really to say, how could we use uh, immersive technology and virtual reality to literally take people and give them a lived experience through a gamified uh, VR portal on what that experience is like for people? Um, and that includes everything from gender biases to racial biases, which are quite a big problem here in South Africa, uh, to even disabilities. And it's incredibly cool. You, you put on the VR headset and you can, you've got a little game and you can choose who to support in certain different uh, categories. So if, uh, if Jason had said to me, oh, Alex, you're, you're a woman, you're so emotional. Um, Karen, who oh is uh, take, doing, wearing the, the In My Shoes uh, headset, yeah. <laughs> she can choose to support Jason or to support me. And there are different options that come up based <laughs> on, on that. And it really, the people who've, who've experienced it, and we're using it quite extensively with our staff, and they love it, um, mostly because it's just very cool, but it's opening their eyes in ways that people didn't expect, because it's very different to read an account and intellectually mm. sort of process and go, oh, okay, yeah, kind of, to live that experience in a way that your brain, even though it's cartoony, perceives as real. And mm. for all that, and uh, Jason, you know, I know you've got a lot of experience mm. here, Physical VR training is amazing. It can save you a lot of money. The cost of failure is significantly lowered. But the soft skill training in VR and augmented reality doesn't get nearly as much hype. But it's actually as important, especially in white collar businesses. Yeah, if not more important. Sure. You know, uh, it's kind of because it needs that, mm, continuous, that continuous learning. I feel like with a hard skill, a technical skill, which, which is necessary, right? You kind of learn it once and then you've got it. But you constantly need to be learning yes. these soft skills like empathy, problem solving, critical thinking. And, and it's not job specific, Absolutely. right? You need it for every element of, of your life. Um, Absolutely. Uh, and that's something that can happen in, in businesses and in schools and universities. Mm. And it's, it's a technology that we're not seeing 
it being, I don't use the word exploited, but we're not seeing its full potential yet. Um, I believe you guys have a, a report coming out on this fairly soon. So let me quickly yeah. plug that for you. I can't wait to read it because yeah. this is an Thank area that I think it. is going to see massive growth, <laughs> massive growth over the next few years. Yes. And on that note. I, yeah, I 100% agree. On, on, yeah, on, on that note, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> this this podcast was brought to you by our soft skills report. Um, but, you know, Alex, when, when you mention that, it's quite interesting just, you know, in terms of the adoption, I think one of the barriers to the soft skills adoption in, in corporates, I mean, is just soft skills in general, that training, um, because they often think, people often think, well, it's not measurable, it's kind of, it's very light, it's a little bit iffy, like, can you really teach it? And then when you have the VR conversation, some people get it and the other people are kind of on the fence. are like, well, it would be a nice to have, but we still can't measure it. Um, won't they feel like the headset's clunky? Will they really feel like they're an immersive experience? And what you've just said kind of counters all of that because even though they've got mm. this headset on, they really, really do feel like they are in that experience. And you're able to measure mm. kind of the analytics the tracking all in real time. Um, is that something that you see Absolutely. coming to, to the forefront? Absolutely. So the technology, as we all know, is still very, very new. And the art of the possible hasn't even begun to really been ex be explored. Uh, if you look at the latest uh, Oculus device from, uh, from Meta, um, what it is capable of doing in terms of facial analytics Okay, honestly, actually quite scary, um, the amount of data they can get from it. But it's really going to, to start feeding into those analytics and that feedback on training and on VR. Um, everyone sort of thinks of the commercial use cases. Okay, I look here for, for more than a couple of seconds, then, you know, pop, pop me an ad. But if you think about it in terms of training, whether it's hard or soft skills, you're getting that feedback based in, re in real time. You can set a baseline for me the first time I run through this training um, and you can see how I react to it. Then you can run a similar if not identical training in a few months time and see how it's changed you can see how i react and as this technology improves we're going to see this um uh this joining of the augmented reality technology and data analytics and even machine learning within that capability and through that we're going to develop better and better programs that are going to be more and more effective in being able to train people and being able to show people what lived experiences are really really like Yes, yeah, so I'd, I'd like to just is, ex, just talk a little bit more about the analytics side because I think it's it's a really fascinating part that a lot of people forget about when it comes to immersive technology mm -hmm. and and education is that yeah you know, his, historically when when we started doing training a long time ago um, it was normally face to face so the the instructor who was training you was able to observe and figure out does this person actually mm -hmm. understand what I'm, what I'm teaching them? Mm -hmm. And they could ask that person to repeat back what they had learned, um, to, to follow the motions and movements and see, have they kind of grasped it? Are they going to master what I'm trying to teach them? And as, as technology has been introduced and as, as learning has had to scale, we've now sat behind what I think is a fundamental problem in the way that we learn, which is that no one's really sure if the learning is working and i think you know we yes. we always talk about this really really um, mind-blowing statistic that um you know that talks about how seven out of ten people in in organizations believe that they lack the the skills to master the jobs that they're doing which is pretty frightening and and we say that you know despite companies on average spending about a thousand dollars per employee on training something's obviously not working out. And I think one of the key elements here is that sits in this analytical space. And I can imagine someone sitting, you know, going through an e-learning module, um, you know, coming out the end of it, getting that certificate and not really understanding what they've learned, not having mastery and not even being able to practice mm -hmm. what they've learned. And mm -hmm. I think the analytics side is, is something that. Mm -hmm. I think can make a fundamental change to that. So I'm curious as to mm. as to kind of where you where you think you talked about this idea of the art of the possible not having been um, discovered yet, and and Meta's new um, you know kind of of uh, 
VR headset, the the Oculus Pro, which is which is having just for us to say kind of of cues and, and eye tracking. Where do you see this going over time? I mean, how, how do you you can how do you see the analytics playing out? I think if I can take it almost back to gaming. Mm. So in a game, if you take a a multiplayer game. Uh, depending on what you've got, you're going to have leaderboards, you're going to have scores, you're going to be able to get to the end of a training and you're actually going to get a score directly out of it that's based not just on your interactions in the program, but based on your reactions there. Um, so uh, let, let's take Beat Saber. So, you know, you, as you go along, you get better, you hit more of those blocks, hands going, <laughs> um, and and you can see your improvement there. But that that feedback is then also being given back to the people who are doing the training. I say whether that is a company or a university or whether that is a school. Um, so, so you're going to have two avenues of it. And I think it is as important to have that, that, um, that feedback to the individual on what they're doing and how they're improving. Um, because it's not just for us to say, okay, you know, Karen really, you know, she's not great with people. Uh, we need to put her through training. She needs yeah. to be able to see for herself from a training perspective, how are you doing? Because then you can start thinking, okay, I did this training, I, I did better here. Oh, wait, now I'm dealing with Alex. And hey, we're having a great conversation. Um, for, for my side, if I take a, a, a simple example, um, while I'm absolutely fantastic in a business meeting, if you drop me in the middle of a cocktail party, it is my idea of hell. So I would love something like a VR program. No, seriously, <laughs> like intro, you know, social introvert. <laughs> I would do a VR so, cocktail so party. So absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> so, so training for me to be able to go up and sort of insert myself into a conversation without feeling like I'm invading that conversation, that's something that I can see for myself would be absolutely amazing. And you take that to the business context. So I absolutely see a world where we take it beyond just the program and we've, uh, we've built it and you live through it and we start getting that feedback. So everything is, uh, I mean, you, this is actually a perfect edge computing device. It does all the calculations on device and just sends the results back up to the cloud where it goes through a machine learning analytic uh, program or just, you know, straight into a database uh, and with some sticker BI dashboard on top of it. And you're going to start getting some amazing insights. I mean, we had seen the insights that wearable devices for fitness have uh, have brought yeah. to uh, brought to bear. So, so the more, on the one hand, you know, the amount of data people know about us does get very scary. And I know that there are privacy concerns, especially around this type of thing, and those can't be understated. But as we learn and as we develop and as we have the protective legislations around this, I think that the overall positive really stands to change how we interact with people and how we how we gain new skills if people understand that it's benefiting them so the the information isn't just going to your team lead and kind of they are holding it if they are part of that conversation then they automatically would take ownership of it right and and mm. that's kind yeah. of the inf- i would be happy for somebody to have my data on that i'd be sharing it with everyone if i can <laughs> improve it's well, almost like yeah. you know jason and i you you've spoke well not, maybe not yes. the fitness one, but yeah. No, no, no. So, I, I think <laughs> I think there's there's a very there's a very interesting point that you're touching on, and 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 mm. Alex Alex even mentioned the word gamification, and I, I think the exciting part for me is is less about how others access your data and more about how my motivation mm. and my aspirations change as a result of that immediacy of feedback of information. So, you know, in, in, a, in a game world, I think we achieve mastery in a game because we have mm-hmm. a, lot of, a lot of goals that we can immediately measure. You know, like, you know, are my hit points high enough to take on this, this, this boss? You know, do I have a, like, do, did I beat my high score? You know, have I mastered this, like, ridiculous move that contains 17 buttons and joystick movements to be able to shoot a firebolt out of my backside? You know, whatever it ends up being in the game, we have that immediacy effect. And I think one of the big problems of learning is is it's engineered around like finding out at the end whether you are competent or not. You know, so we, I remember, <laughs> I remember many years ago when when I I used to be this thing called an enterprise architect. Um, I had been practicing it, and then I did this thing called the Open Group Architecture Framework course. And I thought I really knew it. And then I sat in front of of the exam 
Um, and it, it's just amazing when they ask you questions and contextually you're sitting there looking at that question, you realize you actually haven't grasped as much of the content as you thought you did. Mm. Somehow I managed right. to scrape through, but the, the, the part about the analytics and the part about the gamification, which is so fascinating for me, is, is the we are motivated by, you know, by having clear goals, which analytics can, def- can help us define um, without us having to think about that ourselves, but also being able to see continuous progress on those goals and continuous progress on our mastery and our, our level of mastery. But it, it then leads me to another interesting question. And I suppose it's just a hypothetical question is in a lot of soft skills, it's about how well and effectively you communicate in a high stakes situation. So, um, and, and in that, in that sense, you know, like, like you said, at the cocktail party, I'm still, I'm, I'm banking the VR cocktail party experience. It's, it's going to happen, <laughs> but Fabulous. yeah. Um, Sign that's up. well. I mean, that's that's really it's going to be fabulous. But the the whole idea, <laughs> um, I think, is around this this idea of communication is that what we say is a small fraction and component of how we communicate to people and the world around us. Yes. And body language is kind of contributes, from what I remember, more than half of how we perceive the other person communicating towards us and it, mm. it reads so many different factors yeah. and 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 levels into the communication it's like the proverbial onion of communication mm. and the the technology that we're starting to see with the facial tracking and the eye tracking i think is is fascinating because it's mm. starting to give us a sense of how we can start to bring that into soft skills training so mm. i'm curious have, have you kind of given thoughts to that element of, of soft skills training, the communication being more than just mm. what we say and how we say it, but mm. but also how we present ourselves and whether you see technology being able to start to address some of that communication. So it's as technology progresses, I think I, I think it's going to get quite quite interesting, less with virtual reality. Um, although obviously as that improves uh, we'll certainly start to be able to see more of the body cues. You know, one day we might even get legs. Mm-hmm. Uh, and <laughs> I mean, the main need... reason that you see avatars without <laughs> yeah, don't, don't tell <laughs> you see avatars without legs is because <laughs> well, but the, but the big reason you don't see avatars with legs is because they can't track what your lower body is mm-hmm. doing with a VR headset as it stands right now, at least not very well. But as the oh. technology improves and as we we sort of move towards. Um, more augmented reality it might not be a vr headset it might be your computer and you stand in front of it and you're wearing a headset but it's actually tracking full body motion i think it's sony has these amazing uh wristbands and ankle bands that lets you actually tracks exactly how your body is moving um also an interesting one where i think they're tracking movement via wi-fi now so they can literally kind of see where you are i'm afraid i can't remember exactly where i saw that but the way technology is changing to allow us to see that movement i talk with my hands talk with my face as well, but I talk with my hands and that is a big part of communication. But where it gets very interesting for me is in the future where we are all wearing our little digital glasses, theoretically, um, what are the analytics going to be saying that when I walk into the room, I'm wearing my glasses, but it's doing all the analytics of body language for me. That's Mm. suddenly where it gets interesting. Um, Okay, wait, no, Karen really doesn't want to talk to me. I can see my, my glasses are telling me, you know, she's not so keen, step back. Should we be having that type of technology? The technically, there's no reason we can't. <laughs> I'm just, the I'm just imagining becomes, Karen's glasses going we? try harder, damn it, because hers are reading off your analytics, <laughs> and her analytics are saying Alex's analytics <laughs> don't don't think your body language is good enough, and her analytics are saying doing better. Do, mm. so yeah, it's it's it's, mm. it's going to get quite mm. hilarious, I think, at times with mm. with all of this analytics mm. and how we start mm. how it starts to influence our behaviour, and how we actually become mm. marionette puppets to to the AI master. Well, exactly. I guess it's a very fine line between the two. Yes, I mean, as I, as I always say when I'm chatting to people, technology can do anything. You know, so, so we may have to wait a few years for some, but the technology is capable. But it's how you temper that with what, not even what should be done, but how you temper that with keeping our humanity intact and yeah. keeping um, that interpersonal humanness uh, is also incredibly important. And that's why we need the the thought leadership around around that side of it, whether it's legislation, governance, 
uh, whether it is ethical considerations, because tech is agnostic. Tech doesn't care, um, but people do. Yeah, I think that's a big challenge and um, always one that seems to come come after tech innovation. And and I guess this is touching a, a little bit on um, the the kind of your Africa metaverse and your world metaverse and, and the, mm. the ethical, um, I suppose, challenges mm. of an emergent technology like this and the, mm. the good with the bad. And I guess my like, my question is is probably a bit of a, a, a kind of a counter narrative one is, so if we take a look at technologies like the internet, um, personal computers, and, and the things that have like fundamentally um, evolved us from a technology perspective, the the whole idea around like, how was how was this going to be used um, and what were the downsides weren't so much the conversation at the beginning when the technology was being um, rolled out and adopted. And, and part of me, as much as I don't disagree with the need for ethics and the dangers of the internet and how, you know, as, as a society and civilization, somehow we always find ways to use things for bad, uh, even if their intention um, mm-hmm. was for good. Yeah. Uh, Oppenheimer might back me on that. And the, the, the but, but the conundrum is with ethics being almost the front end of the conversation. Do you think that's going to be a, a barrier to the speed and adoption of this technology? No, I think if uh, history has taught us anything, it's that um, capitalism will come first uh, and the ethical considerations will follow. Um, I don't necessarily think that it is all uh, all gloom and doom. I certainly don't think that some of the more dystopian narratives around this uh, are going to come to pass. Uh, I think fundamentally people are um, generally, on the whole, more good than bad. Um, there are a few players who who are going to abuse it, but that's going to be true regardless whether it is augmented or virtual reality technology, whether it's AI, whether it is uh, virtual currencies, digital assets. You know, they they are going to you're going to see the spectrum. Um, I think that it's not going to so much hinder the technological advancements, but I think from an adoption perspective, having those guidelines, having those global standards, even having global legislation is going to speed up adoption because a lot of the reason that these emerging technologies, less so in VR, but certainly in your metaverses, uh, your sort of internet metaverses, in uh, a lot of your blockchain-based technologies, for example, Mm. corporate adoption is hindered um, by the fact that they don't know what they are and they aren't allowed to do. And they don't know what the implications of that are. They don't want to spend a lot of money before they understand that. So having those things in place gives a level of comfort to the people who are really going to throw big money at it, number one. Yeah. Um, and because they're the, the likes of a big uh, big five tech companies throwing a lot of money at it, they've already got the audience, which means it's going to have adoption by the man on the street. Um, right now, I mean, as, as we've said before, we're incredibly early in this technology. People are using it, but not nearly as widely as they will be in a year or two years or three years. So I think that... The conversations are important, but I think the adoption will speed up once we know what the parameters should be and what what the limits are. You know, will, will there be yeah. a GDPR for the metaverse? Quite possibly, um, but we need those guidelines so we can actually get people comfortable with the idea. Maybe a more recent a more recent example would be Chat GPT. So around that and yes. how everybody's you know, amazing tech, but everybody's kind of got their knickers in a knot, uh, specifically uh, education institutions. I mean, interestingly, when you talk about there's more good than bad, which I completely agree with, um, a student at, I think, Stanford developed an app within like nine weeks of it being launched to identify whether something had been written. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Right. And so, but I do think at the moment there's kind of can we use it for varsities? Can't we? Like, where do we go? And we almost have to kind of put, like you say, those those guardrails or ring fences and say, this is where you can play. This is maybe not where you can do it. And then that adoption will go forward. I think we, we all love sort of some rules or structure. 
Yes, yeah, so it just maybe not much like with, the, with with well, well, actually, yes, that's the other side of the coin. Is is why uh, why why did we put rules on Chat GPT? Why can't I ask it questions? You know, why can't I get it to tell me uh, jokes about uh, about blondes and uh, and, and Barbie type women? Um, so, so again, that, that's that's really looking at the ethical considerations. Uh, but but yes, one of the things I found interesting is one of the uh, one of the profs went viral in the states. I forget which university he was with. But because he requires that chat GPT be used in his course, there are guidelines around it, but he actually requires it to be done. Um, what, what I find interesting from a tech perspective, because it's, it's an incredibly powerful tool, um, but I saw a great meme that basically said um, uh, before chat GPT, two hours of coding, six hours of debugging. With chat GPT, <laughs> five minutes coding, 24 hours debugging. So, you know, it's, just, it's got good and bad. Yeah. yeah. It's like any evolutionary thing, you know, when, when I, when I had to do my dissertation, I, I was reminiscing on, thank God, how easy this is because I have Google and Google Scholar. And I can imagine having to go to a library using the Dewey Decimal System and trying to figure out <laughs> where the heck I was going to find my World literature. Book Encyclopedia. Oh, yeah. oh, those were so cool. I mean, don't, don't get me started. Uh, those transparencies mm. with the human body were my favorite thing mm. still today. I think that was genius. Mm. Um, but I, I guess the, the, the ethical part is also probably very prevalent because the mm. the reality is that the what's largely what's driving this metaverse conversation is the adoption already on platforms that are largely um, populated by kids and the, yeah. the the sort of implications. So it's quite fascinating because I think with the internet it was probably more of a older generation that adopted it. Um, social media it was the kind of younger mm. kind of 20 somethings mm. you know kind of um I'll, that's enough about me let's talk mm. about me johnny bravo type vibes and and then you know with with this kind of of roblox and minecraft we've now dropped down another layer in the kind of mm. of dem mm. demographic and and i guess that's maybe part of the reason why mm. ethics is such a and and privacy concerns are such a big conversation mm. in this do you agree with that? Absolutely. And it's where does limit, uh, limitation of liability lie? So with yeah. Roblox, while there are, uh, everyone creates their own games and it is ultimately owned by a single company. What we're seeing now, though, is uh, if we take the likes of something like Decentraland uh, as an online blockchain based metaverse, um, no one, it's not a company, no one owns it. It's a decentralized um, platform on which everyone owns little bits and pieces. So where does the responsibility lie? If I have space there uh, as a business, I have space there and uh, someone is, uh, let's take a terrible example, soliciting child porn in the space on the metaverse that I own, am mm. I responsible for that? And it's the same sort of question that says in a physical building for an office, is are you responsible if someone is doing a drug deal in the bathroom on the ground floor? Yeah. And, and those are the sort of questions that corporates certainly want answered. They want to know where their limitation of liability is. They want to know what they're responsible for and what they're not. Because just as you don't want the drug deals in the bathroom, you don't want the dodgy dealings happening in your, in your virtual space. So it's, I think that is ultimately a barrier to adoption. I, I had an interesting conversation with the financial service house this week. They were talking exactly about that. They're saying, you know, this is very cool. We're very keen. We want new channels to connect with people. But, you know, can you answer us about this? And the fact of the matter is that right now, globally, we can't, even legislatively in individual countries, we can't, because what metaverse and virtual reality do, it makes the world smaller, which on one hand is great. It's taking down barriers. We've talked about different lived experiences that you get to now engage with. You get to engage with people you never would have engaged with previously. But where does jurisdiction lie? If uh, if you're selling me something you shouldn't and you are based in the UK and I'm based in South Africa, um, who's liable? Um, it, it becomes very, very difficult from a corporate perspective. And that's why I spend a lot of my time talking to corporates about this sort of tech. Um, and my advice really at the moment for most corporates is do your research, understand the art of the possible, pick your use cases with care and start experimenting. But probably don't pull a full Microsoft or Google and uh, put, commit your entire IT budget to it because a lot of these questions are still outstanding. Mm. And we need clarity on that from a corporate perspective. 
Yeah, and and I could have a fascinating philosophical debate around you know the 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 problems with with current geopolitics and borders and the implications that that mm. creates and the challenges of Absolutely. the internet and now the metaverse. I think is going to put even more of a pressure on how mm. do technologies yeah. that are decentralized that don't technically live within the mm. context of a country's borders how are they governed and managed yes. because you generally then need more of a, a mm. global set of rules and regulations mm. um, and and i guess yeah. and i think that's precisely why the world economic forum has had the metaverse uh, as one of its pillars for the last couple of years now i think it was year two this year and i saw ai was one of them this year mm. as well obviously that's just finished last week um but it, it is promising that we are seeing that engagement at a global level by uh, the level of leadership, such as the World Economic Forum, whether you, whether you like them or not, it should be discussed. And I'm glad to see that it is being discussed. Okay, so let's let's come back to one of the mm. things we talked about uh, right at the beginning, which is mm. Mm. your your kind of of uh, you live in South Africa, um, and you mm -hmm. you're very involved in the the kind of African community, and you you talked a little bit about mm. you know the the fact that when you went to that crypto conference you knew a lot of a lot of the global players were but none of the african players and mm -hmm. i know that this is something that you are personally very passionate about and one of the driving mm -hmm. forces behind this africa web3 revolution mm -hmm. so tell us a little bit about you know why why you believe this is so important what is the big hairy audacious mm -hmm. goal that you're trying to achieve with this and and where are you seeing some of the early success mm -hmm. stories so I think the big, hairy, audacious goal is that companies that are based in, staffed by and started within Africa are as well known as their European or American counterparts, or even their Asian uh, Asian counterparts. Um, I think South America has, has very similar problems that we do. Um, but in, in general, I find that Africa is certainly the, the, uh, the ignored continent. We are in many ways still the dark continent um, in that you know, people just don't know what's there. Um, if we look in terms of venture capital, not just in terms of Web3, but in general, only 1.2% of global, global venture capital dollars went to Africa last year, all of Africa. Uh, there are 56 countries here. It's, it's a lot of space. It's a lot of people. But there's very, very limited investment globally into Africa. But it also has the potential for some of the most amazing adoption. Um, one of the really, really uh, promising uh, companies within the Web3 space and sort of more on the, uh, the crypto space is, is Yellow Card. And they've just ro rolled out sort of across Africa their Yellow Pay functionality, which enables very quick cross-border transactions. Um, and that's um, one of the big problems we have. We've got a very uh, large population of workers who go between different countries across Africa to work, but they want to send money home. And it's incredibly hard to do so when you consider the percentage of population that is unbanked. So especially in a finance space, what we're seeing uh, within Africa, I think we'll see faster adoption here and more use cases here than you will see in the developed world. Um, and But it is going to inform what happens in the, in the developed world going forward. So, so there are things, uh, if we just take innovation, for example, um, we've got to do things differently here. Power is an issue. Uh, Karen and I, both in South Africa, we have uh, rolling blackouts uh, because our power utility and power grid is uh, under too much strain uh, and there just there isn't enough power to go around. Uh, it's not just us, by the way. America is in much the same condition. They yeah. haven't hit it yet, but their power grids are also uh, under serious strain. But that's true across a lot of countries in Africa. In Nigeria, the first lightning node in Africa went live uh, about two weeks ago. And that's obviously that, that facilitates Bitcoin transactions. It's on a laptop connected to a generator. You know, it's not in a server. It's not, you know, it's in some nice uh, cooled AWS uh, data store. It, it is sitting, the node is on a laptop connected to a generator. So I think from an African perspective, people are willing to try things that would never even be thought of uh, in, a, in a more developed world context. Um, just talking about power, one of our very cool use cases, uh, there's a South African uh, company called Moment, M-O-M-I-N-T, and what they're getting into is fractionalized solar power. So what you do is you buy a solar cell or a portion of a solar cell as an NFT, 
Uh, they then do the installation onto, say, a school or onto uh, another area that requires uh, requires power. And then you get a return on investment on that uh, fractionalized solar cell, uh, or alternatively, you can sell it on the marketplace. Um, and they're seeing really, really great traction there. But it addresses probably actually three issues. Issue one, power. We get more power. That's mm. good. Issue two, uh, it's giving access to investment to people who previously didn't have access. Because I think the minimum buy-in is about... Uh, so it's less than ten dollars. It's really quite. Uh, it's really quite cheap, um, and so you can give them an income. And uh, then issue three, I have forgotten offhand. But but yes, it's 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 addressing multiple issues and giving access to people. Um, just as sort of a final note on on the Africa Web three stuff, I went to uh, a conference, a, a Web three tech conference in the township uh, Kailicha, so township basically informal housing for the most part. But they're doing some of the most amazing things there. They have built a basically a takeaway delivery system into WhatsApp, one of the companies there. And you can pay for your pizza by crypt using crypto. You know, I can't do that on my first world iPhone takeaway, <laughs> uh, takeaway app. I can't pay with crypto for that. But I can do it via WhatsApp in the center of the township. And that's amazing. So you, you've got people who are thinking outside of the box because the challenges are different. And that's really what I find so inspiring. Mm -hmm. And that's really one of the main reasons I kind of thought, you know, let's connect people. If, if all that happens is that I connect, have some cool conversations, I connect some founders with some people who've done it before, and we share some information. And hopefully a few of my network who are overseas actually start realizing, hey, people are doing cool stuff in Africa. I'm happy. Obviously, mm -hmm. I would love it to go viral and everyone to know about it one day. But if all I do is connect a few people and make their lives a bit better, I consider it a win. I mean, so so I wonder if the, the context within Africa is also because we've got these so-called wicked problems, right? So yeah. with with NFTs and, and you're talking about the electricity and, and that's a massive problem, right? Even the, the access to food or takeaways or whatever, for me, sometimes that's a massive problem. But, you know, using the NFTs to get, I don't know, a digital asset like a, the latest Louis Vuitton handbag, it's kind of... It's not really relevant, whereas here in South Africa, we've got, yeah. well, in Africa, we've got real pressing problems that almost motivate mm -hmm. people, will ac accelerate that, that period in mm -hmm. terms of trying to find a solution using the latest mm -hmm. technology. Absolutely. And if we take it back to, uh, since this is about immersive tech, we take it back to augmented reality and virtual reality. Having a center or, or having a um, set of centers where people can come and access um, this type of technology and training programs. So they don't need to have it at home. They don't need their own devices. Oh. Um, but having that sort of thing set up and having programs, especially when we're looking at uh, even basics and foundational phase education, um, I think it's going to be game changing because currently uh, what we have is that good ex education is only really accessible to those who have money. Um, and yeah. theoretically, well, everyone's on the same curriculum, but there's a vast difference in the quality of education, the quality of teaching. And we can really democratize that through the use of something like, like mm -hmm. automated reality and virtual reality. Um, something like a science lab, you know, a high school science lab. Most of our schools in South Africa don't have it. Mm. If you've got a uh, augmented, if you, if you can get a donation of 20 augmented reality devices preloaded with a science curriculum, you can now actually go into that space and do those experiments without requiring a fully kitted out science lab. So, this is what makes me so excited. I think that this tech is going to actually give advantages to people who've never even expected to have them. So final question, putting you on the spot here. In mm. this whole Web3 immersive tech okay. space, um, everybody always plays the, what, what is it going to be like in five years time? Um, hypothetical kind of, of <laughs> aspirational visionary thing. <laughs> but you're involved in a very broad sense across a whole bunch of different aspects of Web3 and immersive technology. Um, mm. if, if you were a company right now who was seeing Meta kind of of selling these VR headsets, it was seeing Apple coming out with this new like mixed reality headset and, and Lenovo, like one of the biggest kind of business tech providers mm. coming out with their mixed reality headset. You were seeing ChatGPT. You were seeing Google floundering and and like 
putting doubling down on AI to kind of of like you know make sure that they don't become irrelevant in this conversation and, and all of these kind of technologies culminating. And you were sitting in this in this kind of business executive's shoes. Where where do you think they should be thinking? This is what I need to focus on in the next one to five years to try and and make sure that I'm not missing the bandwagon, but at the same time, I'm doing practical real world stuff that's going to deliver business value. I can actually answer that question very well because it, it is so one of the, the cornerstones of, of what I talk about when I chat to corporates, when I chat to, to C-level executives. Uh, and it really focuses on a couple of things. So the first one is certainly in the next year, focus on education. Don't throw your bucks at technology, focus on education. Know what is out there and know what the possibilities are within your industry. And that's certainly something that I, I personally help with within my role at EOH. Um, because you can't build what you don't know is out there. And the problem is if you don't know, you're gonna believe the hype. So right now everyone's about chat GPT, but AI is still very, very new. That generative AI, it's awesome. But again, it's early days. We don't know what the art of the possible is going to be there. Um, and then once you understand whether it is virtual reality, augmented reality, blockchain based ledger systems, decentralized finance, um, anything else, Start thinking about what use cases are relevant for you that you can start experimenting with. Um, and then it's quite simple. Build fast, build for value, and for God's sake, get feedback from the people you're building it for because you think you know what they want, but you don't. And then go back and you follow that process. Don't spend millions and millions of rands, dollars, uh, euros, whatever currency you're using. Just actually start experimenting and build on your experimentation. Um, this is not a buy the farm type type scenario. Um, the one area I would certainly say to to start with first more than anything else, uh, learn about central bank digital currencies. They are coming, uh, whether you like it or not. Uh, right now, I think my figure is probably out of date, but last time I checked, 105 countries with representing 95% of global GDP were at least investigating digital currencies. Uh, 10 or more countries have launched them, including Nigeria, which is trying to get rid of physical cash. Um, so how is this going to affect your business? How is this going to, how is digital cash going to change someone who is unbanked being able to actually for the first time buy something online without a bank account? How is this going to change how you do an EFT payment or how you do a credit card payment? So, so that's probably one of the first areas to look at. And then obviously, I mean, this is immersive reality. I would say from an educational perspective, see what the art of the possible is in virtual reality or in augmented reality, um, especially if you have high training costs for, for physical labor. Um, as uh, I think Jason can tell you, he's got some amazing use cases there that had very swift ROI. But also, as we said at the beginning, think about your soft skills. Where are your problems internally? Um, for a very minimal investment, you can get 10 VR headsets. Uh, you can subscribe to a program such as In My Shoes and you can actually have a massive impact on your staff and on your business. So, so those would be the two primary areas, but please educate and please talk to your customers uh, because if you don't, you're going to get it wrong. Thank you so much, Alex. Um, always so lovely just chatting to you and for sharing your knowledge and um, yeah, some amazing use cases, super handy. Yeah, thank you so much again for having me. Really wonderful to be here and uh, hopefully we can do this again sometime. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Immersive Tech and Business. If you found our podcast helpful, please subscribe. Subscribing not only keeps you up to date on new episodes, but it allows us to keep bringing you really great content. Seeing as you stuck around for the end credits, and this isn't even a Marvel movie, we have some free goodies to say thank you. See the links below to grab your free copy of our Practice Makes Perfect report and a free infographic about the power of VR for learning. You can also check out our Reality Bytes blog for even more useful information on immersive tech. And that's a wrap. See you next time.